Are the new spectacles AR glasses worth buying? How robust are the Spectacles AR development tools? Well, I will tell you all about it today. So the new Spectacles AR glasses were unveiled during my last trip to LA for the Snap Partner Summit. And honestly, I had a hunch that Snap was working on new AR glasses. And also, as many of the employees and friends from Snap, whether there was going to be an announcement or not, and all I received were responses such as, Dilmer, you're going to love what we have for you here. Others were just simply smiling back, but their faces honestly told me everything I needed to know. At the end of the announcement, Snap CEO Evan Spiegel told the whole crowd how he was going to say we have one more thing, but in reality, they had a couple. And at that moment, I realized that my dreams of seeing new XR hardware from Snap perhaps was going to come to reality. Well, that hunch came to reality when Evan announced the new spectacles and did a full live demo on a stage which gave me goosebumps because there it was a fully working pair of AR glasses that was completely a standalone and no battery pack with two powerful Snapdragon processors. It also has two full high resolution cameras, two infrared computer vision cameras, six axis IMUs for inertial sensing, waveguide optics, full hand tracking and multimodal support for input, fast real-time scene understanding, and an extremely light device having a weight of 226 grams. To put this in perspective, the Apple Vision Pro is close to 650 grams, Magic Leap 2 is 260 grams, just the headset, and that excludes the computer pack. Also, MetaQuest 3 is about 515 grams, HoloLens 2, 566 grams, so 226 grams, in my opinion, is very impressive, even when we have 45 minutes of runtime, which you could always connect to an external power pack if you wanted to extend the time. So here's also a look at what to expect when you receive your own spectacles. The packaging was honestly beautiful. You'll get a protective glass cover, a small carrying bag, and a USB-C cable as well. There's also an option if you want to use prescription inserts in case you need those. To give you an idea of how spectacles work, let me go ahead and put them on. I'm gonna walk you through the initial setup. First, we're gonna be holding the right button for three seconds which is going to basically power on the device. When the glasses are on, you will see a beautiful Spectacles logo, and then you'll be required to download the Spectacles application, which is available for iOS and Android. Press and hold the left button for seven seconds until the glasses enter pairing mode. The app will then ask you to set up the Spectacles Wi-Fi network, use your phone's camera to estimate your eye distance, provide a few permissions, and then the setup process should complete after this point. Spectacles will then provide you with a mini tutorial to help you understand how to use hand tracking gestures, such as pinch to select, pinch and hold to move objects around, two hand pinch to scale objects, and ray interactions to interact with objects or UI that are located away from us. Snap also thought greatly about hand menus, more likely inspired from HoloLens 2 hand menu interactions, which you can also use by using Snap Spectacles by keeping your hand palm open and facing upwards or towards you. You can also in there interact with my AI. You can view different options for lenses. You can pause your lenses, resume your lenses, or close them if you like to do so. You can also face your palm down, which is going to give you the option to adjust the volume, brightness, spectacles tint, and additional settings. Within the spectacles application, you have options to basically mirror your phone, which is actually a really cool feature. It feels to have a decent connection speed, but there's still some latency since it's communicating via Wi-Fi. There's also a really cool feature, which is an spectator feature, which not too many AR or MR devices manufacturers have available today. But I'm really glad that Snap included it as it allows you to easily capture a third person view of your running experiences. The controller toggle is also really helpful. Spectacles not only provides and tracking features, but they also offer something called multimodal. This allows you to basically capture input from the hands, from mobile controllers, and also from voice. All right, now let's take a look at some of the cool experiences available with the Spectacles right after you set it up. These are all really interesting because they will demo some of the powerful Spectacle features, from playing games such as this fan boxing game, to using in-depth educational apps, 
which in this case gives you a beautiful look at the human anatomy. Can you show me Saturn? Now, if you're a fan of space exploration, then this experience will allow you to explore space and use voice combined with AI to help you understand our complex solar system. Lastly, with this experience, you'll be able to see the power of using real-time scene understanding that is shipped with the spectacle. All right, guys, so the first thing that you're gonna get when you open the new version of Lens Studio, 5.1 or greater, it's going to be the Spectacles application. If you want to fill it out and apply, that's how you're going to get the Spectacles. And then if you go under Preferences, Editor, let's make sure that you have TypeScript and then JavaScript enabled. Also, we're going to be using the plugin for VS Code Lens Studio. It's going to give you basically autocomplete and other features for debugging. Then in Lens Studio, we're going to go into Project Settings and this is where we're going to give our project a name we can uncheck mobile and web and then also enable spectacles. Then we're gonna have a lot of different features in here to basically test with the spectacles. I think the tools in Lens Studio and I don't only think, but they're actually pretty cool because you can simulate a lot of what you would do in the actual you know, physical device. You can change the lighting conditions by using different rooms. You can zoom in with your mouse, you can basically use WASD to basically to move around, which is really helpful. It also simulates the edges of the actual device. So this is, uh, you know, the FOV it's simulating here, which is also going to be very helpful as you develop new experiences. You can also simulate the frame rate and also the different eyes that get used when using spectacles. And then in this case, we're also going to be, you know, if you want to use a different environment, maybe more colorful, you can also do that. But I'm gonna set it here to sunlit room. There are also different hand gestures that you can simulate, which is really cool if you want to implement, you know, different menus or different interactions based on the gestures, and you can do that. Then you also need to enable the TypeScript window. And this is, I think it's a panel or a window, but basically it allows you to determine if the, you know, the actual TypeScript code has been compiled or not. So this is really helpful because we're gonna be importing a package here in a few seconds. Now go into your camera and we're gonna be changing the tracking mode from surface to world, basically by adding the device tracking component. Then you're gonna be selecting where we're gonna be putting this project. I call it solar system, so that's where we're gonna be designating. Then in the asset library, this is where you can import different components. For spectacles, we're gonna be using the spectacles interaction kit, but you can look at the other ones as well that are available as of today. And then let's go ahead and just import the Spectacles Interaction Kit. After we install it, you're gonna be able to do that. And then we can see that the Spectacles Interaction Kit was compiled successfully. You can also unpack it, and we're gonna need that because we're gonna be using some of these components in our custom TypeScript. So if you don't do it, then it won't allow you to reference some of those packages. So it's gonna be very helpful. And, and require that you do that when you implement your own interactions. Then let's just go ahead and drag and drop the Spectacles Interaction Kit component to your hierarchy. And then here you can look at the structure. The team behind this component already set up everything for you. You have hand interactors. There's also a mouse interactor and also a mobile interactor. So when I refer to multimodal, this is what this system is going to allow you to do. It's going to allow you to do basically input and capture input from different components, such as your mouse, mobile, and also the built-in interactors, which is going to be hands. There's also an interactor cursor, and that's what you know shows on the right hand, this is helpful for, you know, far interactions when you're interacting with UI, when you're interacting with 3D models that are in a far, you know, far away from you. And then the UI is really not required. This is just an example that the team put together where you can test the interactions by using this component, which is available in the brief app. So if you look in here, we have a scroll views, we have buttons that we can interact with. We also have, in this case, 3D models that you can interact with, but I'm basically using the navigation to move from left to right. I can also hold the actual left click and then that it's going to allow you to interact and, and move objects. You can also click on them and then drag the scroll view and that's going to allow you to simulate what you would do with hand tracking in the real device. 
This is also pretty cool because it allows you to move this panel around. You can basically drag it around and it's going to simulate what it would happen. So I can also resize it. So really cool features for rapid iteration that, you know, that a lot of devices today don't have available. And as you guys can see, this is going to allow you to really quickly test different features without having to deploy to the actual device. You can also go to full screen like I show you right now, and it's going to remove the basically the field of view and it's going to go to full screen, which you can also use if you wanted to work that way. And then I also hit the reset button on the top. Basically, it's like a refresh. It will reset everything. That's going to be very helpful when you're testing and you want to go back to the original state. So now if we go into the asset library, let's go ahead and start working on our tutorial. So I'm going to go ahead and import the solar system from the 3D components in the asset library. Once you do that, you're going to get this folder. We can double click here on this specific component and it's going to allow you to basically copy anything that we have in here, right? The way that I'm going to set it up though is I'm going to copy and paste it to be under the spectacles interaction kit because that's where they put everything in the template. So in my case, I'm just going to go ahead and you know place it there, rename it, and then we can reposition it to be at the right location just like I'm doing right now. And then what you can do as well, though, is we can also, in this case, look at each one of the planets. So I'm going to be adding quickly different interactions and the SIK package, which stands for Spectacles Interaction Kit, allows you to use its components to enable interactions where each object is going to need a physics collider, also an interactable component, which is what I'm going to be adding right now as well, in addition to the physics collider. And then you can designate what the targeting mode is going to be. So I'm also going to be adding an interactable manipulation. And this is a component that they show us during Lens Fest that is going to allow us to move objects around. There's different options in there that you can also look at, but it's going to allow you to drag them and, and move them around and also scale them. Also, the interactable outline feedback is going to basically create an outline around the objects that we're going to be interacting with. You can change the colors in here, the hovering color, and also the activating color. And then also the outline weight is going to be pretty helpful if you want to you know, change the thickness of the outline. Then if we go back in here, we're also going to need to add basically the mesh for each one of these components so that the underlying shader can basically target the appropriate mesh. The next thing that we need to do is I also want to change the outline width on the planet so you can, you guys can see here that we can change it to 0.15 if you wanted to, you know, make that a little bit thicker. And then if you want to tweak it a little bit more, we can also change it here to maybe be 0.20. It's going to be, you know, it's going to match more closely to the sun. And the planets are smaller, you know, the anything other than the sun is going to be smaller. So I wanted to make the outline a lot bigger on those. And then there's also a component called the interactable squish feedback. And that's basically going to do what it says. It's going to squish any objects that you add this component to. So in my case, I'm going to add it only to the sun and we can change it here to be about 0.90. I think I'm going to change it later on to be 0.90 and 0.90, but I want to show you here how this is going to be askew a little bit when you, you know, when you select it. And then if we go back here to 90, now it's going to be, it's going to be basically keeping the aspect ratio. And then we can move around like I showed you before. And then at the same time, it's going to have an outline. So pretty easy to add these features just by basically adding the components that they have out of the box. I'm going to be adding a TypeScript component that is going to display the name of each planet. So I'm going to show you how easy that is to implement. This is going to be inheriting from base script component. And if you guys are Unity developers, this is going to be very similar to a mono behavior. The input in this case is going to be the component that we need to pass into this class. And then that's going to be very similar again to mono behavior in, in this, in the case of a mono behavior is going to be a serializable field. Well, in the Lens Studio world, this is going to be called input. We also have an awake and also an on star method that we're going to be basically using. The on awake is going to be part of the template, but we can also create an event that is going to bind to multiple lifecycle events. In this case, the on star event is going to be bound to the on star function that I have 
in this, you know, in this class. And then once I do that, all I need to do is basically access the interactable component, which is part of this class, which is why I'm saying this. And then within the interactable, we have multiple events that we can, you know, that we can actually bind to. In this case, I'm gonna bind to the on trigger star and also the on trigger n, so that I can show you when we interact with the planets and select them, how this is going to respond. So what I'm gonna do here, just to keep it simple, is we're going to be displaying, in this case, it's gonna be on trigger star, executed on object, and we can also get the object name that is going to be associated with this component. To get that information, we're gonna do these, that same object, that name, that should give you the name of the planet. And then in the other instance, I'm gonna basically just change this to be on trigger n, and then we can leave everything as it is. You can remove the interactor that gets passed in. We don't really need it. I just wanna show you here what's available. But in the case that you don't need it, which in my case, I don't, we can just go ahead and remove it. And then I think this should be everything. So if we go back into Lens Studio, now we can associate the components to have that TypeScript behavior. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna select all the planets and then we can associate that planet details components. I'm going to get a TypeScript error and the reason for that is because we are expecting an input and the input type is interactable. So I don't really like this because we have to pass in every single interactable, but I just wanna show you how it works and then we can change the code later to get that from the component itself. On trigger a star is displayed in the logger and now so on trigger n. So everything is working as expected. So if we go back here to planet details, we can probably make this a little bit smaller so we can see the entire line getting printed. You can see here, I just make a few changes, save, and then TypeScript compilation succeeded. And now we can see the new messages being displayed. So if we remove the interactable from the actual, you know, class, we can now get it in a different way. And I'm gonna show you how we can do that. So I'm gonna create a new variable, which is gonna be called interaction manager. And then we can access the interaction manager through the SIK package. And that's going to have a method in here called get interactable by scene object, where we can pass in the scene object. You need to remove the word this because we don't have that instance in this class. Now we're just getting that from the interaction manager and then using or a scope instance to be able to access that information. So now if we go back into Lens Studio, you're gonna see that the code is now simpler and we don't have to be passing in any of those interactables manually. And you can see that everything is working. So now the next thing that I wanna do though is I wanna display a text that is going to be showing under each planet. For that, we're going to be adding a text 3D. And then I'm gonna go ahead and rename it to be planet name text. So you guys are gonna see that this is pretty gigantic, but that's okay. We can go ahead and change the bottom bouncing here to be negative 3.70. And then you can tweak also the font size. Basically, we're gonna tweak it so that it shows correctly under each one of the planets. So if we do negative 0.60 or maybe a little bit less than that, I think in this case should work. I think I'm also going to be changing the material here because I don't want it to be 3D and I also want to just have it to be plain white. So we can change the colors and that really depends on what you want to do in your own experience. I'm gonna make everything solid just to keep things clean and simple and then also the color is going to be white. You guys can see that everything is showing on the right hand side right out of the bat, which is cool because this is going to allow us to test you know, quickly by looking at the preview window. And then if we rename it to planet, that's just going to you know, imply that it's a variable that we're gonna be replacing through code. And then in this case, we can make it maybe a little bit smaller. I think this is, I think this works. Negative 3.90 maybe. Okay, because these small planets are gonna have a different scale. So just wanna tweak it until it looks good to you. And then we can go ahead and copy and paste those components to all the different planets. I'm also going to be, you know, zeroing out the rotation because I want everything to be, you know, consistent across all the different planets. And then lastly, we can do Jupiter in here. And I think everything else should now be clean and we should be able to interact with everything. So now what we need to do though is we need to add a new input. In this case, I'm going to basically pass that in. So I'm just gonna use the text 3D type and then the variable name is going to be planet name text. And then what I'm gonna do is on awake though, we can set it to false. I don't wanna display the actual text because I want people to start hovering over the actual 
3D objects or planets before the labels get actually rendered. So another method that we can bind to is going to be on hover enter. And this function is going to be triggered when the cursor is positioned right on the objects, depending on where our hands are going to be pointing to. So in this case, we're going to set it to true. And also I'm going to be changing the name of this text to be the actual object name. So we're going to have the different planet names displaying correctly. And then when we're not hovering anymore, we're going to be basically just hiding the planet name text. So if we go back here into Lens Studio, then you're going to see here that we still have errors. And the reason for that is because each one of these planets are going to now expect that we pass in the actual text 3D. So I'm going to go ahead and add that to these two different planets. And then I'm going to do it pretty quickly in here. So now the last one is going to be the moon. And then now if we hit refresh, you can see that all the different planets have their names under them and everything is working correctly. We can, you know, go in and then move around the simulated scene. So another thing that I want to do though, is I want to add a new interactable. And I want to show you this because this is going to be the foundation of extending SIK with your own implementation. In our case, we're going to be adding an interactable rotator, which is going to be applying rotation to objects that we have selected or objects that we have an active hover on. All right, so to do this, we're going to be implementing the interactable rotator and adding two input variables for rotation axis as a 3D vector and the rotation speed as a number. Then we're going to be adding an instance variable for our interactable and one to track our object's rotational state. Next, we'll be adding a few functions, one to bind to lifecycle events, then an init, rotate object, and connect callbacks. In our define script events, we'll be binding to on a start event to call into our init function. Then we'll need to check for rotation within our update event, which is going to be responsible for calling into our rotation function. We'll use on enable and on disable events to set the appropriate rotation state. The init function implementation is pretty simple. We'll just get our objects interactable reference and call into our connect callbacks. Now the connect callbacks function implementation is going to be responsible to bind to on hover events and then set the appropriate rotation state. The rotate object function will get our objects transform, calculate a rotation delta and apply our delta by multiplying our current object world rotation times our delta value. So now that we have this interactable rotator, we should be able to see it here under our components. And you can change here the rotation axis. In my case, I just want to have Y to be one. And then the rotation speed, we're going to change it to something smaller, like 0.75. I think it's going to work fine. You can see here, as I am selecting them and dragging them around, it's going to basically rotate the planets. This is going to allow you to play audio, specifically when we're hovering or when trigger starts and also when trigger in. So if you look at the Spectacles interaction kit, you're gonna see that there's audio available for you already there. You can use that or you can use your own. And then to test the experience, I'm going to go ahead and connect the device via USB-C. You guys can see here that it says connect it. And then all you need to do to get a deploy is click on send to connect the Spectacles. And this is going to package everything, deploy to the device and also launch the experience. So you guys can see here that we have indicators in our pinch area that came from the SIK package that we installed. We can also interact with the different components by using one or two hands. We can also test our interactable component that we added, which is the interactable rotator and things are working seamlessly. So overall, I can't really say nothing but good things about spectacles because the device is really solid. The whole onboarding process was really straightforward. Development tools are really robust and they provide rapid iteration. We can use TypeScript, which has a very similar structure to Mono Behaviors if you're using Unity. The documentation is great and pushing lenses to the device couldn't be easier. I do, however, wish the battery life was longer than 45 minutes as I found myself having to charge the device often. However, I did connect it to my Mac as I was doing development, which you can do by using the USB-C cable that is included. That helped quite a bit. But what about the $99 per month with a 12 month commitment, right? You might be thinking about that question. And I thought about that as well. So to me, that is an investment towards your future. Honestly, that amount of money will allow you to create and iterate on any ideas 
that you may have for mixed reality while utilizing a very convenient and lightweight piece of hardware. And perhaps the Snap Spectacles is the right place to start for your own prototyping needs. All right, guys, so that is everything for today. If you guys have additional questions from what I covered today, please let me know in the comments below. Make sure to hit subscribe. Also set the notification bell to on so that you guys can get notified when I make new videos about spectacles and also any other content as it relates to XR. Also, big thanks to my patrons for supporting my content. I really appreciate it and happy XR coding, everyone.